Welcome, uh, everyone, uh, here in person and online. We are absolutely delighted that to have uh, Elliot, Elliot Cohen uh, come and give us a talk today. Um, Elliot has been, is the uh, Robert uh, Osgood uh, Professor at Johns Hopkins, and he has been at SICE since 1990, which is even longer than I've been at SICE. So he's one of the few who's been here longer. Um, and um, he has had a tremendous career. Not only is he uh, an extremely uh, well-known uh, and oft-quoted academic, uh, but he has served in public service, both for the, in the Department of Defense and also as counselor uh, at the Department of State from 2007 to 2009. Um, he has had some best-selling books, such as uh, The Big Stick, uh, which I think is a hockey book, right? 2017. <laughs> Uh, Conquered into Liberty and, um, and the Supreme Command. And um, very importantly, um, Elliot has been a, has taken on major roles at SICE and in fact was Dean of SICE from 2019 to 2021. So he was my boss. Uh, and at a time that was uh, essential for SICE, it was a very difficult time in terms of budget, COVID, all this. Uh, and he was hit with it and did a great job in setting up the school uh, for the strong position that it's in right now. So again, Elliot, was, we're delighted to have you come back. Actually, he was on a sabbatical here. He spent a sabbatical in the fall of uh, 2013, correct? And so he's no stranger to Bologna, but he hasn't been here since before that pandemic. So thanks so much for coming. And we look forward to your talk on assessing uh, the Ukraine war, uh, what uh, analysis analysts got right, what they got wrong, and uh, what they missed all together. So please, okay. Elliot. Should I start from here? Or... Great. Well, thank you. Thanks for that introduction. Uh, this is, it is truly wonderful to be back. You know, um, <clears throat> I mean, I always thought Bologna was a wonderful place after we had that sabbatical here. Uh, I really fell in love with it as did my wife. Uh, and it's particularly good to be here because as Mike said, uh, he and I and Bart and others have been through some uh, pretty challenging times uh, when I was asked to become Dean for a couple of years and uh, we got through it and of course, the school's in a better, better shape than ever. And you folks in particular are just rolling in dough as far as I understand. I'm waiting for Director Plummer to begin lighting cigars with a hundred dollar bill and, you know, Bart to begin dancing with a lampshade on top of his head and, you know, carousing and stuff like that. But seriously, it's, yeah, oh yeah, well, I didn't have to. Um, really, it's great to be back. And it's, it's particularly great to be back at this, uh, this moment, as I think uh, some of you know, this is my last year teaching at SICE. I won't form formally retire from the school uh, for another year or so, because I, I have some terminal leave, uh, but I've had a wonderful career here for over 32 years. It's really been the bulk of my professional career. Uh, the school has given me a great deal. I'd like to think I've been able to give back to it in some measure. Okay, so let's talk about the Ukraine war. Um, and let me just start with um, explaining why I'm interested in this. So I'm beginning a project with a colleague of mine, Phil O'Brien, who is the head of the School of International Relations at um, St. Andrews University in Scotland. He's a very distinguished World War II historian. And he and I began corresponding over the Ukraine war, we had, I think, similar takes on it quite early on. And uh, as we corresponded, we, we actually finally met in person for the first time uh, only uh, a couple months ago. Uh, we were really struck at how far off the initial assessments and judgments uh, of the relative balance of forces between Russia and Ukraine were. And as uh, we thought about it, it seemed to us intellectually interesting enough to be worth a project. So we're, we're launching a project, we have a series of conferences, we've lined up uh, some, some sponsors, 
and we've begun doing things like putting together databases and whatnot. So let me begin uh, just by saying, you know, as the great English military historian Michael Howard said, before war, everybody gets it pretty much wrong. True enough. Uh, and let me also stress, we're not out to vilify or crucify the, uh, the people who got things quite wrong. Um, and they're not alone. I mean, there have been quite a few quite dramatic misestimates of the correlation of forces, as the Soviets would have said, uh, throughout history. You know, if you were to ask military experts around the world in April 1940, how do you think a the big conflict between the French and the Germans might go, they wouldn't have expected France to fall in six weeks. Um, if reputable military analysts in the United States, Israel and elsewhere um, did not anticipate how well the Egyptians and Syrians would perform in 1973, how close they would come to really very dramatic success. Uh, and then, indeed they achieved many successes. And similarly, I, I vividly remember before the first Gulf War in 1991, the, you know, the responsible estimates were that, yes, the United States and its allies would prevail, but the cost would be something like 10,000 casualties. And of course, it was uh, uh, far, far more lopsided than that. The United States lost more troops to traffic accidents than to hostile fire. Uh, but, this is important, and it seems to me it's actually, given the nature of the military analysis business, people are often reluctant to ask themselves in a serious way, well, why exactly did we get it wrong? And I think it's particularly important in this case because um, right now, if, and this is actually why we're getting some government sponsorship for this work, people are looking at the Indo-Pacific and they're looking at China, Taiwan. And there, uh, there's a great deal of military analytic work that's being done in government, outside government, at places like RAND or CSIS. Um, and you have to wonder, are we making some of the same kinds of mistakes? So uh, let me plunge in with, and these are all preliminary thoughts, uh, but I think they're reasonably well-based. I'm gonna begin with the conventional wisdom. For those of you who like to have texts to work for, I would commend to you uh, Samuel Charup and Scott Boston. The, those are two analysts at RAND. Uh, the West's weapons won't make any difference to Ukraine. Great title. Uh, that was in foreign policy on January 21st, 2022. And then the other is uh, somebody who's ubiquitous at, uh, from Center for Naval Analyses, Michael Kaufman and a colleague of his, Jeffrey Edmonds. Uh, Russia's shock and awe, Moscow's use of overwhelming force against Ukraine. That was in Foreign Affairs, February 22nd, 2022, two days before the war began. What was the, <clears throat> the conventional wisdom? And I'm not just picking on uh, these gentlemen, they were among the most prominent, but their views were quite widely held. Well, the assumption was basically there was going to be a rapid blitzkrieg which would collapse Ukrainian forces um, and that what you would have would either be the ra rapid occupation of all of Ukraine by the Russian military, or at the very least, the occupation of the eastern half of the country from the Dnipro River east, but also to include Kyiv, the collapse of the Ukrainian government. And if the war were to continue, maybe some kind of insurgency, but possibly not even that. And what was the sort of the rough outlines of this assessment? Well, that the Russians were utterly superior in all dimensions, uh, that they would have not only air superiority, but air supremacy, uh, that they had vastly more firepower at their disposal with, of course, this is what the Russians traditionally have been very strong in uh, artillery, um, that they had an extremely mobile mechanized force at their disposal, that they would be able to command and control it, and that they had military doctrine, that is to say, the kind of authoritative guidance on how you conduct uh, offensive operations of a very, very high order, um, to include a, an organizational innovation uh, 
the creation of battalion tactical groups. What the Russians would do, uh, what they're just, well, they're, not, they're no longer doing it because they're in such a chaotic mess at the moment, but uh, they would take a regiment or a brigade, they would pull out the contract troops. Uh, so it'd be a maneuver battalion and then they would give them lots of artillery and supporting elements and you would keep the conscripts at home. And this was partly for political reasons, but I think also partly for quality reasons, because the contract troops, not quite professional as we would understand them, or career soldiers, but people who had volunteered for at least another year uh, were seen to be higher quality. And of course, the Russians had the initiative. They got to decide, A, that there would be a war and when it would start and where it would be fought. The judgment about the Ukrainians was, well, maybe they're a bit better than they were in 2014 when they lost first Crimea and Donbass, but they're over, overextended, inexperienced in mobile warfare, under-equipped, and perhaps most importantly of all, with weak political leadership, a comic actor for goodness sakes, um, as president, uh, and a population that in large measure, particularly in the Eastern part of the country, was either apathetic or vaguely sympathetic to the Russians. To sum it all up, uh, uh, Samuel Charup and Scott Boston, and I quote, in short, the military balance between Russia and Ukraine is so lopsided in Moscow's favor that any assistance Washington might provide in coming weeks would be largely irrelevant in determining the outcome of a conflict should it begin. Russia's advantages in capacity, capability, and geography combined to pose insurmountable challenges for Ukrainian forces tasked with defending their country. Let that be a warning to any future military analysts here not to be categorical in your predictions. Okay, so where were the analysts right? Well, they, on the biggest issue, of course, uh, that the war was coming. Um, which was not a universally held view. The, in fact, the Ukrainians themselves seem to, have, and particularly the Ukrainian government, the military may have been somewhat different, does not seem to have been completely convinced that a war was coming, actually for pretty good reason. And that was because they weren't seeing the kinds of, all the kinds of preparations that you would expect for an attack. Basically, the Russians didn't tell the vast majority of their own people that they were going to war until a couple of hours before they began moving, which caused all kinds of problems. Still, um, most of that was derivative, I think, from American, uh, from American intelligence, which, as you'll all remember, was uh, being disseminated quite broadly. And I think that um, I will also give them credit for seeing that President Putin's determination was driven by not just uh, you know, resentment over NATO expansion, but a, a deep, deep anger and frustration towards the West. And to some extent, the fear of the spread of Ukrainian style democratic contagion. Although I think in retrospect, um, what they've underestimated was the extent to which this war is really part of a larger effort to reverse the settlement of 1989 to 1991. This is, I think, a, it's a fundamental rejection of that settlement. I, just to step back for a moment, my wife uh, retired as the chief, uh, the head of the photographic archives at the Holocaust Museum. She actually gave a talk here when we were visiting about Holocaust photography. And one thing she taught me is all photographs are crop. That is, you decide what's in the frame and what's out of the frame. And uh, in a way, that's, that's an important way of thinking about the origins of a war. You know, we, if, if you think about what's our crop of this war, it's well it began on February 24th of this year. What's the Ukrainian crop? It began in 2014. Uh, and 2014 to this day looms very large in the Ukrainian imagination. I was, I was telling Director Plummer, I was in, had, I had the great opportunity to visit Kyiv uh, about six or eight weeks ago uh, to meet with President Zelensky and uh, some members of the general staff and others. And one of the things that struck me about downtown Kiev is the memorials to 2014, including walls covered with photographs of fallen soldiers. So they, 
the Ukrainian view is we've been at war since 2014. I think Vladimir Putin's view is this goes back to pick your date, 1990, 1991, to a, a settlement of the Cold War, which was profoundly unfair, inappropriate, um, a violation of, of history. Okay, but mostly the picture that um, the analyst painted ended up being off. Of course, instead of a blitz, uh, there was the initial seizure of about 20% of Ukrainian territory, um, including the approach to Kyiv, in the east around Kharkiv, and in the south, including the city of Kherson. But then, of course, as you'll recall, the offensive bogs down around Kyiv. The Russians withdraw from the Kyiv area in April. The Ukrainians launch a successful, that was a withdrawal under pressure, but it was not, I think, as much of an open defeat. Around Kharkiv in uh, late spring in May, um, it was a defeat and a collapse of the Russian front line. And then of course, uh, this fall, October, November, the fall of Kherson and the Ukrainian liberation of basically everything west of the Dnipro River. And I don't think it's over there, uh, a friend of mine, Lieutenant General Ben Hodges, former commander of US Army Europe, is quite convinced that the Ukrainians will have taken Crimea back by this summer. Certainly what's, what has happened so far is the Ukrainians have recovered more than half of the territory they lost, um, but there's much more to it than that. Um, let me just mention a few things. The Russian Air Force played a, an important role for the first couple of days and then basically has not been a very important uh, presence on the battlefield. It's been important chiefly for delivering attacks, long range attacks, one has to say, um, against Ukrainian infrastructure. Russian cyber operations did not, did in no way crippled the Ukrainians. Uh, a whole suite of special operations in Kyiv including dispatching at least three teams with the objective of killing uh, the President Zelensky and his immediate team all failed. The Russians have suffered enormous losses. Um, I think the most reasonable estimate is if you add up killed, severely wounded, missing prisoners, it's probably approaching about 100,000 by now. And on the other side, the Ukrainians proved capable of maneuvering very large forces. Uh, achieving surprise and maintaining truly remarkable operational security. We know much more about the Russians really than we do about the Ukrainians at this point. They've been able to keep secrets um, in a way that the Russians have not, in a way that actually I don't think we'd be able to either, uh, and to really dominate the information space. So what happened? Well, um, we can talk about the initial invasion um, uh, and later on, but let, let's talk about in particular why did uh, why were so, those estimates so often off? And the uh, the text that I think I would refer everybody to there is Daniel Kahneman's wonderful book Thinking Fast and Slow, uh, which really summarizes in a digestible way the path-breaking work and cognitive psychology that he did with Amos Tversky. One of the things that, uh, that they really developed to an art form is defining heuristics. So what are the, kind of the intellectual shortcuts that we use to judge reality, which frequently get us in trouble? And there are two in particular that really struck me in this case. One is the availability heuristic. So uh, what the, the way the availability heuristic works is you know, if you ask somebody what, what, which danger is statistically more likely to happen to you, shark attack or a piece of an airplane falling off the plane and hitting you on the head and killing you? The correct answer is a piece of airplane falling off and hitting you on the head. But everybody's seen Jaws, you know, everybody, you know, sees reports that off, you know, Cape Cod, not far from where I grew up. You know, there are triangular fins breaking water. And so everybody says, shark attack. Not true. The point is, is the things you can bring most easily to mind are the things that you end up looking at. And I think in this case, um, it had 
the, the way the availability heuristic kicked in was first numbers. Numbers, it's easy to count, numbers of tanks and artillery tubes and things of that nature. And technology that has been uh, revealed in one way or another, either voluntarily or involuntarily by an opponent it, to include some of its technical characteristics. It's easy, I think, for military analysts to focus on those, those kinds of things. The things that were harder to really take on board were the impact of poor discipline and say, for example, the consequences that had for the maintenance of Russian vehicles, um, which was a huge part of the problem. The consequences of having the lack of a non-commissioned officer corps, above all the impact of, of corruption, systemic corruption. So to the point that Russian soldiers end up being ill-fed because people have been selling their rations on the open market uh, and they end up eating 40 year old rations if, if that. In the same way, um, I think nobody really thought that much about the Ukrainians simply because most of the military analysts were Russian military analysts and therefore didn't particularly feel a need to go to Ukraine. And actually I've had a conversation with a couple of them, one of whom is still kicking himself for never having visited Ukraine. Now, interestingly enough, those who had spent time in Ukraine, particularly with the Ukrainian military, and that would be particularly uh, um, serving officers in the American, British, and Canadian armies, had a much more optimistic take on how the Ukrainians would do. So if you look at the analysis from the very beginning, people like General Hodges or General Hurtling, uh, General, Lieutenant General Mark Hurtling, um, both of whom had spent a fair bit of time in Ukraine with the Ukrainian military post 2014, had a very, very different take on how well the Ukrainians would do. Uh, another, the other heuristic that really struck me is anchoring. That is our tendency to make judgments from a starting point. So that's why you go into a, uh, a nice restaurant, there'll always be a, you know, a bottle of wine priced at some truly ridiculous price. You will never buy it, but you'll feel really good about yourself for buying the you know, third most expensive thing on the men menu rather than the first one. That's done very deliberately. That's to anchor you at the, the high point. Um, and so you're willing to, to buy off on something that's a little bit short of that. Well, there, there was something similar here as well. And that is the, uh, the fact that, you know, the Russians were able to take Crimea very relatively easily in 2014, but also to occupy a good chunk of uh, Luhansk and Donetsk in 2014 against a Ukrainian uh, army that was, was fairly ineffective. That was basically a modified version of what they had had of sort of an old Soviet era military. And as a result, what people they they tend to people tended to assume, well, they're a bit better than they were in 2014, but they were still anchored on the 2014 performance, not realizing that it's actually uh, they were much much better. It was anchoring at work, I think, in another way, and that has to do with the historical memory of World War II and particularly images of the Red Army. Uh, <clears throat> and I think this is subtler and. I have only some evidence for this, but I think it's, it's for real. Um, and it really has misled people. So for example, our mental image of World War II, not entirely correct, I have to say, but is, you know, there you have the Red Army with vast, vast quantities of manpower, uh, quite literally millions of soldiers. Yeah, but the Russian army in 2022 was about 300,000 troops with about another 100,000 sort of elite units and special forces have grand total of about 400,000. So an order of magnitude smaller than the Red Army of World War II. Quality of leadership. Now, admittedly, uh, Stalin had killed off a lot of the generals in 1938, but that actually opened up the way for a whole bunch of quite talented younger officers, usually from more modest backgrounds to rise to the top very quickly. Um, Again, this will be, this is just a hypothesis, but I think there may be something to it. You know, in Russia in the last 20 years, why would you choose a military career? It doesn't have, near, I mean, some people will do that no matter what. 
um, and very capable people. But on the whole, it doesn't have the same sort of cachet that it had during the Cold War. Uh, it doesn't promise the same material benefits that it used to have. Now, during the Cold War, it was material benefits from perks. Today, the material benefits would be in the form of corruption. Uh, and there is, there is evidence, uh, there is evidence of that. But that would suggest that maybe the quality of leadership is not what it was before. And then finally, there's the question of the industrial base. Um, during World War II, the Russians still had, particularly for military hardware, a fantastic industrial base, which was supplemented by the American industrial base. You know, the, the Red Army rolled on Ford uh, two and a half ton trucks. Uh, that was the Russian armies would not have been able to move actually without American trucks and, and a lot of other supplies that came through. Today, the Russians, although they still have in some ways a robust uh, industry, it's not going to be able to make up the losses that they've already suffered. Then there were some other fallacies which don't I couldn't find in uh, Kahneman, but I think they're out there. One is a, uh, a distinctively intellectuals sort of fallacy. You know, the problem with us intellectuals is we overvalue ideas and we tend to think that they are more important in human affairs than they sometimes are. And I think that applies to military analysts as well. Uh, Russian military doctrine is interesting. It's elegant. It's very well thought out. And it's probably not the most important thing about the Russian army at all. And uh, the tendency to be extremely respectful of it and uh, be impressed by it, I think, misled people. There was the two other kinds, two kinds of underestimation um, at work as well. One is, interestingly enough, I think an underestimation of our own societies. Um, I know for myself, I have been surprised actually by just how, on the whole, all things considered, how unified the Western response has been. Uh, to the Ukraine war and with all of my complaints, and I have a bunch of complaints about the Biden administration, uh, how well on the whole they've exercised leadership. But there's also underestimate in another way, and that's uh, the qualities of Western, in other words, more or less liberal democratic societies. When you look closely at Ukrainian military performance, a lot of it has to do with a real gift for self-organization, for people taking the initiative of, and that's both in formal military units, but also in things like their territorial defense units. And this is a real source of military strength. And I think it was just something that didn't really occur to most analysts to think of that way. And then of course, the underestimate of the role of individuals. Um, in a way you could say we, they overestimated uh, they underestimated Putin's capacity for misjudgment, but for sure people underestimated the role of President uh, Zelensky. I was in at the Munich Security Conference literally the day before the war broke out. And I remember sitting with someone who was, he, was, he had been, he'd come to the country as a teenager from Russia, uh, was absolutely no fan of the Putin government or of Putin, but he assured me with complete certainty that um, Zelensky, who had spoken quite movingly at Munich, would say, well, I, it's just physically impossible to get back to Ukraine. I'm going to fly to London. And uh, he'd kind of wait the war out there in some apartment or something that he had corruptly acquired. He was absolutely certain of that. And of course, that's not it. Um, you know, I wrote a book called Supreme Command, which is about great civilian leadership in wartime. If I were going to add another chapter, I would add that. And if, as a, a observation, I would just say one of the faults of the military analysis industry, as it were, is that it doesn't take personality into account. And I think um, here again, there's a reason why the military historians, even if they're not Russianists, have done better. So I think military historians know actually personalities really matter sometimes. A great civilian leader, a great military leader, and I think the Ukrainians are very fortunate they've got both, can make a tremendous difference. 
Finally, I just want to mention uh, one other, and that is there's a um, there are, there are biases that I think arise that arise when you're in a small analytic community, and actually the community of Russia military analysts is pretty small. They all know each other. It's a, quite a small group of names. Uh, and I would argue that like any small closed group, and of course this is a group that hasn't been super prominent recently when everybody's been focused on China, you're very susceptible to groupthink. And that's again, why I think a lot of the analysis from outside that community, people like Sice alum and a good friend, uh, Major General Mick Ryan of the Australian Army were much better off. I suppose the biggest critique of all is failure to really anticipate that this is a war. Uh, and military analysis is somehow different, I think, from the study of war or certainly of military history. And again, I would point to people like Lawrence Friedman or my friend Phil O'Brien, uh, who I think were, have been much more accurate in judging what was going on. As uh, those of you who have uh, studied with me know, uh, I, it's impossible for me to end a lecture uh, without quoting Winston Churchill at least once. So I, I will do it that way um, and say it's a lesson for all of us. I've got a lot more I can happy to say about what, what I think this war means and where I think it'll go, but we'll, uh, we can save that for the Q&A. In any case, the, uh, the quote is from his wonderful autobiography, My Early Life, which he wrote in the 1930s when of course his career was over. Uh, and he's, he's reflecting on the outbreak of the Boer War and his own desperation to get to the front because he, he was desperately afraid the whole thing's gonna be wrapped up in six weeks. And of course the war went on for three years and helped make his career, but uh, it, you know, shook the British empire to its foundations. And he, as he reflects on that, this is what he says. Let us learn our lessons. Never, never, never believe any war will be smooth and easy or that anyone who embarks on that strange voyage can measure the tides and hurricanes he will encounter. The statesman who yields to war fever must realize that once the signal is given, he is no longer the master of policy, but the slave of unforeseeable and uncontrollable events. Antiquated war offices, weak, incompetent, or arrogant commanders, untrustworthy allies, hostile neutrals, malignant fortune, ugly surprises, awful miscalculations, all take their seats at the council board on the morrow of the declaration of war. Always remember, however sure you are that you can easily win, that there would not be a war if the other man did not think he also had a chance. Okay, with that, let me uh, stop and uh, take uh, any questions or comments you might have. Thanks, uh, thanks so much, Elliot. So um, why don't we open it up for um, questions? Uh, those of you in Zoom land, uh, if you could write your questions uh, in the Q&A box, um, we can uh, submit them eventually to Professor Cohen. So why don't we start? Do you want to do it where we'll take a few questions yeah. and then, yeah, okay. Okay. No, 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 it's not. Okay. Hello, Professor Cohen. I'm Bart Dracula. I work here. But I don't know how to operate my microphone. Where are you she from, Bart? Right. I don't know. Does it work? Can you hear me? So, those of us who saw the future winner of the best picture. Academy Award Top Gun Maverick, uh, understand that the Russian Air Force is formidable. They have the most advanced fighter jets of any country in the world. Why did they so dramatically underperform in the Ukraine? And in spite of the fact that we didn't enact a no-fly zone. So, so they don't actually have the most advanced jets. That's not true? No, Tom Cruise was wrong? No, no it's, one, I mean, it's one of the reasons why uh, the F-35 really is the most advanced 
fighter plane out there, not to mention the B-2, which we were able to have B-21 uh, in terms of bombers. But I think the main thing with the, so first the Russian Air Force, had, oh, no, 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 um, <clears throat> so there are a couple of things about the Russian Air Force. One is it, it has usually been an Air Force which is predominantly focused on supporting the ground concept of maneuver. <clears throat> it, you don't have the, quite the same independent air power tradition that you have in the United States or that you, that you had in Great Britain. Um, there, as the Russians revised how they thought about military operations in the, the fir first part of this century, uh, the one kind of strategic role is doing what they're doing now, which is smashing infrastructure. So as they've thought about a war with NATO, you know, it's been part of their doctrine now for some time that what you do is you take out electricity, water, that you destroy civilian infrastructure. Uh, their, but their larger problems are their, by and large, their pilots don't get enough training. Um, they have a rel relatively small number of them. That's why the Ukrainians began picking up as either cap captures or dead, um, quite young pilots and quite old pilots, some of whom had been recalled to, uh, have been recalled to active duty. And, you know, this is again, where the, the stuff that you can't, you don't really, it's kind of hard to see and it's hard to think about catches you, you know, a, at the, a, I think it's fair to say most of my Air Force friends would say, okay, what's really, really important? What, is, what are some of the things that are really, really important about the functioning of the US Air Force? They would say it's the quality of the enlisted maintenance force of whom they take very good care uh, because none of these magnificent machines are worth anything if they are not exquisitely maintained. And in a system that's riddled with corruption and you know, bad discipline and all that, you know, they're just not going to be as well kept um, as, as others are. Now, you know, they had a substantial numeric, uh, they had substantial numeric odds on their side, but it is astounding that the Ukrainian Air Force is still flying. And on some days they're flying more sorties, not many, like a couple of dozen, uh, than, the, than the Russians are. So the Russian Air Force has, has underperformed, except at the very beginning. The one last thing though I would say on this is the Ukrainians have been helped. And again, this is something we don't, we're not gonna know in the nature of things for some time at least by um, getting access to Western intelligence. So I think that, and how, the extent to which that includes operational intelligence, like, you know, real time, they're coming after you. Um, I don't know, but that's that certainly helped. But it's in general the Russian military, I think, comes across. And people, would, some people would disagree with this. It, it's a much less formidable military than we thought. But if I could, if I could just follow up on that one, just one that one thing, and I think that's also part of what wrong here. You know, if you spend your entire life as a student of grizzly bears but you actually never encounter a grizzly bear doing grizzly bearish things. Um, and when you actually encounter it and it turns out to be kind of mangy and you know, blind in one eye and you know, its claws are actually kind of, kind of cracked and broken um, and it's kind of shambling slowly, it's just hard to accept that. I mean, even because even if you don't, you know, you don't want to ask one out on a date, but you know, it's still a grizzly bear, you know, and that's part of what makes your life worthwhile is you're studying these big fearsome beasts. And I think it makes it a little bit harder to say, no, maybe in this case, it, it, it's a dangerous animal to be sure, but it's kind of a mangy, you know, shambling half blind grizzly bear. Is it working? Oh, okay. Hi, Professor, thank you for being here. My name is Rana Najad. Um, my question to you is how significant would you say um, Iranian military assistance is to Russia 
would you say this will change the trajectory of the war in any way? So uh, the very fact that the Russians have to depend on, uh, Ukra on Iranian weaponry, that's actually very revealing. I mean, the, the two countries that we know, well, the North Koreans, there's some evidence that they're, they're supplying them stuff, and then there's the Iranians. The, the first thing that that should make you go is, whoa, 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 the you know, fabulous Russian military industrial complex clearly has some pretty tremendous limitations if they rely on it. Um, no, it, you know, it clearly makes a difference. What will make a bigger difference is that the Iranians have uh, done very well at developing ballistic missiles. We haven't seen those come into play yet. Um, the drones are important by virtue of numbers, not quality. Um, and the Ukrainians have gotten better and better at shooting them at shooting them down, but they can they can still do damage. The ballistic missiles would be um, might be something else now. But there again, they'll, you know, it's a war. So the fog of war is going to lie thick over everything. My guess is that there will be people um, out there trying to prevent the Iranians from actually being able to deliver those things. And some of, I think, the, the things that will be done to stop that will be, um, won't be out in the open. Some of it will be out in the open. I mean, the, the Ukrainians have already hit at least one Iranian base in Crimea from which they were operating drones. So I think that'll, you know, those guys, if they're combatants, they'll be another target. Um, and depending on whether we give the Ukrainians long range weaponry, you know, they'll, they'll be another way that you deal with the Iranian problem, but it, it, it it'll be significant. I think really once if, if, and when they really deliver ballistic missiles. So, Matt, what are you doing here? <laughs> Professor Cohen, uh, welcome. Uh, I'm Matt Coker, um, and I am uh, visiting Bologna from the mothership in DC. Um, so one of the factors that you didn't mention in your discussion was um, sort of the, the analytic problem of understanding the inside of authoritarian regimes yep. from our sort of democratic perspective. Um, so this, it seems, was also a problem in 2003 in which the United States had a difficult time understanding why the Hussein regime would make some of the apparently irrational decisions that, that it made. This takes us a bit away from comparative politics, uh, from, from military analysis to comparative politics. And I wonder if you can say a bit um, about sort of pairing the intelligence failures of 2003 and yeah. 2022. So, um... First, it's great to see you here. I, I, uh, I feel I want to throw you a bouquet because uh, without Professor Coker's good work, um, our not only the PhD program, but the doctorate in international affairs, which I helped launch when I was a vice dean and uh, pushed ever along, would not have come to fruition. So the, the school's really in your debt, Matt. Uh, uh, I, really, I really believe that. Yeah, it's, you know, it's very interesting. I think to some extent, this is, you know, this is innate to war. Um, it's one of the reasons why I, I just gave my last lecture in a, my class, Art of Strategic Decision. And one of the, uh, the, the, the topic of the last lecture is the strategic virtues. And one of them is empathy. Uh, the ability to crawl inside the other's skin. And we are particularly bad at it, but frankly, so is everybody else. You know, Hitler didn't understand Churchill at all. In the case of uh, Iraq, you know, we actually, uh, I think, blew it in, uh, in 91 as well in a certain way that we didn't understand in, in both 91 and even more so in 2003, how much of Saddam's thinking was oriented on Iran and on the Shia population and actually not oriented on us or you know, I don't think it really occurred to us that maybe he would, uh, you know, lie and be evasive about the nuclear program because he'd be afraid of looking weak to the neighbors. When, you know, I mean, our thinking was, well, 
if he wanted to, you know, avoid the hammer blow that's about to fall on him, he would say, okay, I don't really have a nuclear program. But he might not even have known that he didn't have a nuclear program. I mean, there's stuff about, as you say, the inner workings of these, uh, these regimes that we don't get. And I think it, it does really require that we learn to empathize, including with the people we don't like. And that's why I think, um, you know, so much of the, frankly, some of the sort of IR theory type commentary on the Ukraine war was off because it got hung up on NATO expansion. Instead of seeing it in what I think is the right context, which you can get from what he says and what he writes, you know, this stuff is frequently out there for you to, to see, which is as much more to do with much deeper senses of historical grievance, an image of what Russia should be, an image of what Ukraine really is. I mean, it's, a, it's a much more subtle and, and nuanced kind of thing. Um, and, and frankly, this is why I've always thought SICE has a great mission because part of what we give is, you know, we give the kind of formal structure on, you know, in functional areas, but we also try to give people in-depth understanding of culture and, um, and those sorts of things. And I think it's at, at our best, that's what, that's what we do. Um, and I think it's particularly essential in this case. For sure, Putin, I think genuinely has no sense of that there's any such thing as Ukrainian nationality or nationalism. I just think it's, that's, I don't think he processes that. Uh, I think he sincerely believes that it doesn't exist, that it's a combination of uh, kind of agents of the West and deluded peasants, you know, who have invented a fictitious nationality for themselves. Uh, so I, you know, all wars are in a weird way, a form of communication or, or more often of miscommunication. I think that's, that's it. Uh, hi, thanks again for coming. My name is Sean Wissing, um, and this has been really interesting. My question revolves a little more around, um, I guess, future analysis and how this might end. So one thing we've heard a lot about over the last year has been off ramps that we can provide. Uh, and I think what I've noticed, you know, in my limited capacity as a as a casual Twitter observer, is that uh, people are saying basically the Ukrainians <clears throat> excuse me, won't quit until they have every piece of land back that they've lost, including Crimea, whereas uh, the Russians are apparently unwilling to come to the table. So I guess my question is, A, are we continuing to underestimate the Ukrainians uh, by thinking that they need to broker some kind of deal where they sacrifice land? And B, uh, would you venture to guess how uh, this might end? So... Um... There are actually several questions there. First in general, I believe uh, people begin looking for off ramps when they're ready for an off ramp. They don't begin looking for off ramps when, you know, somebody writing an editorial in the New York Times thinks they should be looking for an off ramp. So it's not gonna it's not gonna happen for a while. Neither side wants one. I think that at the heart of this is this is an existential fight for the Ukrainians. I mean, this war is about the existence of Ukraine. It is about their physical existence in many cases. Um, and, the, you know, for them, this is a war about genocide. That's how they view it, I think, completely understandably. For Russia, it's not existential, but for Vladimir Putin, it's existential. I think the, the one of the problems that you have here is although Putin is perfectly capable of making rational decisions to adjust. So for example, the decision to pull out from Kyiv was, that was a rational decision. They realized they were completely bogged down. If you remember, there's that 40 mile long convoy, which was actually a 40 mile long traffic jam with people shooting at you with missiles. Um, you know, they decided to liquidate that, move the troops around. He's capable of that. For him to walk away from this war, I think that's, he, he isn't going to have the option that Khrushchev or Yeltsin had of a pleasant retirement. I mean, what would be waiting for him at the end of this would be, you know, the mysterious fall from the 17th uh, story window. 
And so, and, and, and even setting that aside, you know, his place in history and all that stuff that's swirling around inside his, inside his head. By the way, just Matt, to your original point, I think it's also why the study of psychology is really important um, as well. I, you know, the one thing I, uh, there were a lot of things I wasn't able to do as Dean, but one of them, I would have loved to hire a psychologist uh, here because, you know, so much depends on what's going on inside his head. So at the moment, there's nothing to compromise, particularly given that the Russians have formally annexed four oblasts of Ukraine and they've given up a major city. And that was a big, that was a big, big deal. And it's just very hard for me to see how they pull back. Um, now, you know, my view on all this is we should be basically giving the Ukrainians just about everything short of nuclear weapons. Um, I do think it's going to have to, you, you could imagine it ending in some sort of stalemate where the Ukrainians are exhausted or we get tired of supplying them or something like that. But then all you're getting is a ceasefire for like five years because the Russians will come, come back again. Um, what I can actually imagine more easily than that is that you're going to have Russian collapses. Kharkiv was a collapse. Uh, there's, I just read a very interesting analysis from a, there's a long, long standing observer of the Russian military who's actually not part of this, this group. And he's, his, his assessment is that the withdrawal from the West Bank of the Dnipro and from Kherson City was to avoid another collapse, which would have potentially been even more destructive. You know, this is, this is a grueling, grueling war. You're, going, you're doing this in the winter. Who, who here has been close to hypothermia? That's for real. And fighting under those conditions is really hard. It'll be awful for the Ukrainians, but it'll probably be a lot more awful for the Russians who are so much more poorly equipped, so much more poorly led, um, that it's conceivable to me that that will happen, particularly if they get long range weapons. The difficult thing for people to accept is um, the Macron hypothesis that you can do this somehow without humiliating the Russians. If they lose the war, it's a humiliation. Just no way around it. There's, you, there's no way you can sugar that pill. And actually you don't want to. That's at the heart of it. Um, the, the most fundamental problem in all this, I think, is I don't see any time in the near future, by which I mean probably a couple of decades, that you're going to see Russia back in a semi-normal relationship with the West. I just don't see how it's going to happen. I mean, I wish, you know, the liberals would rise up and take over, but it's not going to happen, I don't think. I mean, it Maybe it will, but I, I just doubt it. So I think we're going to be in a situation where you'll have a, an angry, humiliated uh, Russia with a, probably a different leader, but somebody who's almost equally unappetizing, chastened, uh, but thinking about revenge and the next round. And I think we should get out of our heads the idea that we'll be able to tie this up and have a something like a return to status quo ante. I think we're in a, um, we're in a different world. I mean, this is a, this is a major historical discontinuity um, and it's gonna take us a while to adjust to it. By the way, I don't think, I, mean, I was talking to one of the authors of the national security strategy and we, which, you know, acknowledges obviously that Russia is an issue, but I said, you know, your, your resourcing is, doesn't really take that into account. So, well, we sort of assume that in five to 10 years, the problem is resolved. And I said, I think that's completely crazy. I, I think it's not going to be resolved in five years or 10 for that matter. Okay, we, we have several uh, questions from, uh, from Zoom land. So why don't we take a few of those and yep. then go back to them. Okay, uh, the first one is, how does the current Russia-Ukraine war affect future thinking about cyber methods in a combined arms offensive. 
so I think that's going to be one of the more interesting things, how people reassess the, uh, the effectiveness of cyber. You know, the, in, in a way, the, our metaphors may be wrong, and we talk about cyber wars if it's war, when really, in some ways, it's more like, um, you know, people use the word viruses. People build up immunities, you know. Hmm. You, you get natural, uh, except these are not entirely natural defenses, but the, the Ukrainians have been, you know, the Ukrainians got hit very hard. You know, they built up defenses. They had a lot of help from uh, Microsoft and Google and, and others. Um, and I think, uh, you know, what this shows is not so much that the Russians aren't good at it. They, they probably are. But, you know, defense has something to say, too. And people have been putting a lot of effort into it. And the, and the more cyber kinds of events you have, the better the resistance is going to be. It's, you know, one of these cases of anti-fragility that, uh, the, that the reaction to some kind of incursion, as long as it doesn't kill you, is to make you stronger. Okay. And that's actually, that's from Nietzsche. That which does it, not destroy me makes me stronger. Okay. Um, uh, another question from uh, Zoomland is, um, you spoke of Putin and Zelensky. What about Biden and Macron and the various UK prime ministers as war leaders? <laughs> uh, Good one, okay, Jeff. I'm going to take my life in my hands. I'm going to say something nice about Boris Johnson. <laughs> So yeah, I can see, I saw a look of shock. Um, I think, I mean, you know, he's an irresponsible guy, but I think there was something, maybe because he wrote a biography of Churchill, but there was something about this event that triggered an effective, a piece of an effective leader in him. And the Brits were really very forward leaning in supporting uh, the Ukrainians, not just in supporting the Ukrainians, but also reaching out to the Swedes uh, and to uh, the East Europeans, saying the right things, going there, which is, was a big deal. So actually, I think the Brits, you know, there's, the Brits still have, despite Brexit and all that stuff, there's still, you know, some of the old reflexes get triggered. And I think they did. Macron, uh, I think he's, I think vanity has a lot to do with this. Uh, I just, you know, I wish there was another way of putting it, but it is, it's a, it's a failing to which, you know, French presidents have been known to succumb. Uh, but, but what I think is more interesting is I, I suspect that what you're seeing now is the beginning of a fundamental shift within NATO where the energy now does not come from the Charlemagne countries. It doesn't come from Germany and France and Italy. It comes from the East and you know, from Poland, some of the other East European states. It'll come from the Nordic states. Uh, the Baltic states, and to some extent, the U.S., Britain, and Canada. And what's going to happen is Germany and France and the others will be kind of pulled along in their way. They, it won't, this is not a tussle for, uh, for control, but, but it's a question of the center of gravity having moved somewhere, uh, somewhere else. Germany, I mean, uh, Germany just is incapable of leading. I mean, it's... They don't, I don't, they don't even want to try to lead, but I think they just don't have the skill set, even if they did. And they would have to have much more military weight for them to uh, be able to do it. The French would, but they tick people off. And more importantly, they also don't have the same military weight. I mean, they've, I give the French a lot of credit, actually, for the things that they've given. They've given about a quarter of their Caesar mobile artillery systems. That's a lot, you know, to give up in the inventory. But that also tells you how little stuff they have in the in the shot locker. Um, so I I think that's actually going to be the most interesting. The Biden administration, I give them an enormous amount of credit for the way they leaked intelligence uh, information in the run up to the war. 
And I, for a couple of reasons. One is it, it did set the table for a pretty unified Western response. It also undid, I think, the uh, hit to American credibility because of the Iraqi nuclear intelligence issue. And, and we shouldn't underestimate the significance of that. I mean, people, you know, the, the European states in particular have ex, on the whole accepted American leadership to a degree I would not have really expected. So I give them credit for that. I give credit, I give Biden credit <coughs> for saying the blunt thing occasionally, like Putin's a war criminal, um, which he is. I give him credit for usually doing the right thing eventually. Like, okay, you know, javelins, then, okay, then the artillery, the M777s, then the high Mars. Uh, where I really, I criticize, I would criticize them is one, I think they have, they've been self deterring You know, the, we were talking about this before coming in here, you know, it, it, it's just foolish to tell the Russians what you're afraid of because they will play it right back at you. And, um, you know, the, the, the thing about Vladimir Putin, to again, go to psychology, what is he fundamentally? He's fundamentally a KGB kind of guy. And what do those people work on? They work on people's weaknesses and fears. And he's very good at that. I mean, it's, even if you remember when, uh, Angela Merkel came to visit. He found out that she was afraid of dogs. So it's the only time he had a dog with him to make her uneasy and throw, throw her off. So they play our fears back to us when in fact they're in actually a pretty weak position. And I think they have been way too reluctant to give the Ukrainians some of the systems that they really need. Um, they're you know slowly coming around, but if you, if you want to end the misery sooner, and at the least cost, then you arm the Ukrainians to the teeth and to the max. How are you doing, Professor? Uh, we spoke briefly before. My name is Omar. Uh, <laughs> I wanted to ask you about what it is about systems and people who dedicate their entire life to understanding war and the mechanics of war, of just offense and defense, that end up time and time again throughout history getting it very wrong and going on wars that they simply seem to have miscalculated or even there's something different like the russians took seven months to hit infrastructure yeah. that's not a miscalculation that seems like there's something else at work that is preventing the system from working the way the the, the designer of the system kind of like the archetypal system of war yeah. is supposed to work and so yeah so, so um You know, I, I remember when I was working for Secretary Rice, I forget what the issue was. And, you know, it was something that seemed perfectly straightforward. And it was just really difficult to get through the interagency system and all that. And, you know, I was whinging at her and she said, Elliot, government is hard. And I think that applies even more to war. It's really, really hard and i think until you do it you don't understand how hard it is and how obscure most of the decisions are so in my art of strategic decision course um, i always start off with these memoranda that winston churchill writes really for franklin roosevelt immediately after pearl harbor he's sailing across the north atlantic on the uh, hms duke of york He's got like five days, to just focus on nothing. He doesn't have to do email. Um, hmm. So he writes these memos on the future course of the war and some parts of it are amazingly prescient and some parts of it are completely out to lunch. And I have the students read it and we talk about, well, okay, what parts of it are prescient and what parts of it are understandably goofy and what parts are just completely out to lunch. And then we talk about it because, okay, here's a guy who vast experience Magnificent military historian on top of everything else. Uh, and yet he still gets a lot of stuff wrong. And I think that's, it's because that's innate. And, you know, the, I mean, the core text on that is Clausewitz, um, you know, who gives us the term, the fog of war. And, but, and I, I really think, I think, uh, I really think that's 
I think that's it. I think, you know, as Tolstoy said, all happy marriages are like all unhappy marriages are unhappy in their own way. I think all unsuccessful military ventures are unsuccessful in their own different ways. Um, I think in the case of the Russians, for example, uh, there was probably a period where Putin did not want to see any prominent military figures. So it took him a while to finally had, settle on um, the current commander who does seem to be in charge of the whole operation. But it was one of the things that was baffling about this is you had like half a dozen generals uh, running this. Why was that the case? Well, it was probably, there's probably a political calculation in that among other things. Uh, in terms of hitting infrastructure, I think it's because their theory of victory, the, the Russian theory of victory has changed repeatedly. So the, the initially, there's been, it was a pretty good piece with, with some limits put out by the Royal United Services Institute um, pretty recently on this. And basically it's sort of an as told to uh, received by the Ukrainian general staff. So you take it with a grain of salt. But their assessment is that the Russians expected it, the initial phase to be done in about four days it, with a shift to occupation duty by D plus 10. You know, that turned out not to work. So then they shift to a different theory of victory. That theory of victory is, well, we'll just kind of grind our way to Kiev. So by April, that doesn't work. So then they say, okay, well, what we'll do is we will take the eastern and southern part of the country and we'll annex that. And, you know, maybe then they were thinking they'd be able to, you know, have a uh, offer some kind of deal that turned out not to work out for them. So they, I think the, you know, the theory of victory now is why we will break the, because among other things, it took them a while to realize that the Ukrainians hate them and are willing to fight like hell. So, okay, we'll break Ukrainian will by destroying their infrastructure. I don't think that's going to work either, but it's, that's why they're doing it now. I mean, remember, if they were going to take over the country, why would you want to smash up the infrastructure? In a way that what this is, is an admission that they don't think they're going to be able to take the country. Uh, thank you for coming, Professor. I'm curious, what do you think the impact of seven years of US, Canadian, and UK security assistance is to the um, efficacy of Ukrainian forces? That's a great question. Um, I think, by the way, I'm glad you mentioned the Canadians because people underestimate the role played. Any Canadians here? Yes. Okay, give <laughs> yourselves a pat on the back. Uh, the, the Canadians actually played uh, quite a large role, partly because the Canadians have a very large Ukrainian uh, population. I think it's one of the larger, largest Ukrainian diasporas um, in the world. I think it made some difference, but actually, I think a lot of this is Ukraine. So here's another kind of error that we frequently make, which is, um, and I think it's great powers are particularly prone to this. We sort of deny agency to everybody else, including our allies. But by the way, there's also the critics of everything that we do are also denying agency to everybody else because they assume it's, it's either all, we get all the credit or we get all the blame. And, you know, that's not the way it is. I think the Ukrainians are actually just, the Ukrainians really sort of restructured themselves in a very serious way. Uh, even, you could see parts of it even during 2014 um, and after. So I think that, that played quite a large role what, what may also have happened is, and again, the details just aren't available yet. We, you know, we may have played a role in helping them with planning. We're certainly, the, 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 the intelligence edge that we've given them is really, I'm sure, going to turn out to be very, very important. That we've, and it's not just us, it's the Brits, I'm sure it's the Finns, it's the Estonians who are really good. It, it love the Poles, for sure. Um, so it's a whole bunch of things, but I, I really believe we are still not giving the Ukrainians credit enough. So I, I'm gonna, I'll just the one example. So the Kharkiv offensive, I think the estimate now is they involved like five armored brigades. And if you read the military analysis done before the war, it said, well, they have no experience maneuvering 
brigade sized forces, a couple of thousand soldiers, you know, 100 tanks or something like that. They, they just, they, they can't do it because they've never done it before. Turns out they could do it. Since we're talking about uh, Canada, uh, Antonio Maioni, uh, who's from McGill University, uh, has a question. Uh, thank you for these illuminating insights, Professor Kong. I'm struck by some of the things you brought up and some of the miscalculations before and during the first months of the conflicts. Um, do we need to do better in teaching about what's important to our future foreign policy defense scholars and leaders? Or is the strong Western front in supporting Ukraine a result of better teaching and research? Uh, I wish I could say it's the result of better teaching and research. But... <laughs> But I don't think so. Like I said, I think we, uh, you know, teaching is, yes, but that's a long-term investment. I think the most important thing actually is the study of military history, because that just gives you a, a sort of a visceral feeling for how things turn out differently than you expect. And, you know, the kinds of the many different kinds of influence that come to play, you know, again, I'll, I'll mention Phil O'Brien, I'll mention Laurie Friedman, uh, among others. It's not, I mean, they're both very fine military historians who've written very powerfully on a number of different wars. I think it just gives you a very different perspective than if you think of what you do in, you know, in terms either of, you know, this peculiar discipline of military analysis as done in uh, the intelligence community or a place like Rand or something like that. Although some of those people are, are quite historically oriented. So it's, I don't mean to make it too sweeping. Or if you do foreign policy, but haven't really thought about the military dimension very much. Um, so I, that, you know, for me, the, the educational takeaway is the more history, the better. Okay, another uh, question. Uh... From Zoomland, a recent piece uh, in Foreign Affairs convincingly argued that Crimea is the real Russian red line, uh, which would be unwise to cross for a number of good reasons. Professor, do you think that realistically this is the case, considering also General Hodge's assessment that Ukrainians may indeed retake Crimea? So it's the Turks who actually, you know, were there first. Um, <laughs> Uh, or the Tatars, uh, for sure, who were exiled by Stalin and to some extent came back and are being discriminated against. You know, it, is, it, is it possible that Crimea has a kind of psychological valence that other parts of Ukraine don't? I don't know. I mean, they, you know, they make a big deal out of Kiev, as, you know, the Kiev and Rus, and this is where it all began and uh, so forth. Uh, so I, I am, I'm not so sure. I think it is where, where there is obviously, you know, the, the history I think does loom large is Sevastopol. So it's, it's obviously the uh, Crimean war, uh, but it's also to some extent, uh, the, the world war II experience. Um, but would they really be willing to fight to the death for it? Does it really, is it a game changer? I don't know. Because I, I, among other things, it's not clear to me what more the Russians can do other than the use of nuclear weapons, which would be self-destructive in so many different ways that I think that the Russians have with, with reason pulled back from it. And, and I, again, I think it's very important to emphasize if there's one thing the Russians tend to focus on, it's how can you get inside our heads? because they are materially a lot weaker. So they would, what they want to do is get inside your head and say, oh no, if something truly awful will happen, if you know, the settlement that had existed in 2014, when Crimea was recognized internationally, including by the Russians, as a part of Ukraine, went back to being a part of Ukraine. I mean, I, I, I find something absurd about it. And by the way, you know, Vladimir Putin said, we have no intention of ever taken Crimea. I mean, you, you can find clips of him saying those things. So that all of a sudden after eight years, this is now an inviolable part of 
Russia, I'm not so sure. I, I will add one other thing though, which is that I think one of the challenges that you have in dealing with Russia is its attitude towards its own borders is it's kind of different from a lot of other countries in that the borders are not seen as being fixed. And that's that's challenge, that's that's a real challenge. You know, they're even Russian generals saying, well, anywhere that Russian soldiers are buried, that's part of Russia. You know, so that would probably include Paris. <laughs> okay, should we go back to the floor? Hi there, Professor, thank you for your time. Uh, my name is Evan, I'm from Michigan in the US. Um, I wrote, we touched on this a little bit, so I, I, had, to, I had to go for this question. Um, I wrote a, a risk analysis for a class uh, claiming that uh, Putin will use technical nuclear weapons in the conflict in part because of uh, the prospect of his, the end of his career being at the end of a rope um, and, and among other reasons as well. Um, you also just mentioned uh, that being a serious red line yeah. backfiring on Russia. Yeah. Um, I, I see a bit of a self-imposed ceiling, though, on the aid that the West is willing to give long-range missiles, like long-range HIMARS being one of them. Do you think, what, what would you envision the blowback being against Russia if they did use tactical nuclear weapons, even against military targets, not necessarily civilian? Um, <laughs> Do you, what do you think the likelihood of, of that happening is? And, and if it did, what would you think the response would be from the, from the West? So the issue is not just the response from the West. Uh, first, you, have to, you would have to assume that the Russian military would execute those orders. And there have been some reports that people have communicated, including the Chinese, with the Russian military saying, don't do that. Think about, let's, let's forget the, the kind of US-led coalition reaction. If you're a Russian general thinking about this, you, you use tactical nuclear weapons. What do you think are the odds that within 10 years there will be Polish nuclear weapons? There may be Finnish nuclear weapons. There will be Turkish nuclear weapons. There will be Kazakh nuclear weapons. And if you're Chinese and looking at this, you say, does this increase or decrease the chances that we will be looking at Japanese nuclear weapons, South Korean nuclear weapons, Taiwanese nuclear weapons, Australian nuclear weapons. But that's the, the long-term reaction is that. And I think that's why all the other forces in that system that are not nuts will say, that's not a world we want to be in. You know, the, the, Biden has promised, and I th I, in this respect, I give him credit. I think he is um, a man of his word on this thing, that the reaction to the use of tactical nuclear weapons would be ferocious. And I could easily imagine a conventional response. If it's a conventional response, that's it for Russian forces, pretty much, in Ukraine. I mean, they, if, if Western air power got engaged, it's, it's really game over. And plus you, you become really the ultimate international pariah. I think at that point, if they use tactical nuclear weapons, you know, the, the, the West and particularly the United States has not unleashed the full power of uh, secondary sanctions, which say you do business with Russia, South Africa, India, whatever it is, you're not doing business with us. I mean, it, it, you add all that up, I think, it just doesn't make any sense at all. Now, the one person for whom it might make sense is Putin if he thinks that he's about to go down the drain and this is one last throw of the dice. But I'm not sure that he's a gambler in quite that um, completely. He, he is a gambler, but uh, more, you know, in the kind of Kenny Rogers, the gambler <laughs> way, you know, as opposed to. You know, the person who, you know, gives away their life savings, you know, on a turn of the roulette wheel. Um, so I, I don't think even then that he'd be likely to do it. And in fact, he backed off. He backed off. Uh, but that, that would be the ultimate price. And I do not think they want to look at Polish or Turkish or Kazakh nuclear weapons. <laughs> 
Sorry, one other question. Um, when you think about the way the Russian force structure has been uh, exposed as rather inadequate to deal with the threats of both Western systems and the reforms that the Ukrainians got to move towards a more Western model, um, what do you think the Chinese military is learning from this and their ability to trust command all the way down and the ability to implement war aims uh, through their structures? Well, I mean, I mean, I'm sure they're going to study it really intensively because that's what the Chinese do. Uh, I'm sure some of the you know lessons learned will be technical. You know, the the issue is this. I mean, one one of the kind of the fundamental issues in the study of military affairs, uh, in civil study of civil military relations in particular, is you know, in what way does a military reflect the society? from which it emerges. And there's no really simple answer to that, but I would say by and large, it sort of does. So the question is, you know, can you have a military which is really run with a great deal of integrity and with a lot of lower level unit leadership and initiative in a society that's extremely controlling? Now, in some ways, you could say, well, you know, you look at the Wehrmacht, there's a lot of initiative and so on, and it was a totalitarian country. But I think the nature of the ideology actually does help explain why they, they're able to do it. And they were building on some traditional strengths of the German military anyway. Um, but I think that's, there will be that. I, I mean, I might, we have an interest, there's an interest, I'm part-time now at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. We have a very interesting project of uh, open source translation work being done on the Sino-Russian relationship with translating Chinese authors writing about Russia and Russian authors writing about China. And what comes across in the translations, at least that I've read, is the Russians being kind of anxious, kind of worried, because they know they're the junior partner here. And the Chinese, and this is before the Ukraine war, there's this kind of note of contempt you know, and I, I think actually from the Russian point of view, the thing to be most worried about is the contempt. The you clods. Um, so I think that there'll be that, but I'm sure they'll be, they'll be, I guess one last thing I think that the Chinese will take away from this though, this, and this I, I would feel pretty confident on. They will take an operational lesson away from this which is if you do Taiwan with a major, with a kind of a coup de main, sort of a, the most important thing is decapitation. So what they will do is that they, I'm sure that one of the things that will say to themselves is the Russians did not devote nearly enough effort to killing Zelensky and his senior leadership. And we will not make that mistake. Um, we're almost out of time, but uh, following up on uh... That last comment, uh, the last question here we have from Zoomland, and, and I'm sorry I couldn't get to all of them. Um, what do you think Ukraine is doing wrong or should be doing more? It's hard to criticize people who are really fighting for their lives. Um, I guess the only thing I would say is don't, you know, don't pick same advice I would give to the polls. Don't pick unnecessary fights with your friends. Uh, in this case, the Germans, who with whatever is problematic are still kind of on your side. Um, you know, it's it's easy to say. I mean, they, they are, you know, I mean, even in the short visit there, but I don't think you have to be there to know this. I mean, these people, this is a war for, not just na national existence, but in some ways, very personal forms of existence. And so people are extraordinarily pressured. And, you know, every mass grave, every, you know, torture, rape, all that, you know, it drives you kind of mad. And so it's, you know, you feel badly saying, okay, but try to keep a level head as you do this. Um, but I would say, you know, that's 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 the most important thing. And I think on the whole, they've been reasonably good about that. Um, I'm sure there'd be technical stuff, but I just don't know enough to know what that might be. Good. Well, we are actually at uh, 
we're actually at eight o'clock. Apologies, any questions we're able to get to, but um, Elliot, this has been a uh, extremely interesting lecture and even an economist like, like myself was able to follow it. You didn't use the jargon that usually come with these lectures and everything. So thanks for that. And uh, I guess just to finish up, uh, I'd like to ask everybody to give a round of applause to Professor Cohen. Hopefully next year when you come back. I'm getting to the screen. I'm getting the call.